But yeah, today we're here to talk about a really neat topic with you guys. Um, it's the history of hip hop and the birth of hip hop and how it's really affected, especially y'all's generation of people, because it's come become such a popular music uh, genre of music to the masses. So today I have two very special guests with me, and as we go through it, I'm going to introduce them. Um, who I have sitting over here to the left of me here is DJ Hurricane. He has had an amazing career in the music industry. And he will be presenting to you guys from his own eyes the birth of the genre of this music that he saw come out of his neighborhood growing up as a young person. Um, Hurricane and I met at Tree Sound Studios when I left this school. And I had a broom in my hand, sweeping up the floors in the studio, as you hear you know, how it works for when you leave this, this college. And I saw his crew coming in and out. And like anybody, I'm like, wow, this is DJ Hurricane. So throughout it, interning, sweeping the floors, hanging out, I finally got invited into the session. And it was for an internship. And I interned on his session. And I can tell you they gave me a lot of I can't a lot of bleep throughout the throughout the whole experience and to be able to share this up here with him today is it's an honor to me hurricane and i have known each other since 1999 and since then since then we have done national tours together we have toured japan europe canada and worked on various projects including another special friend of mine faith evans and again, I, I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on relationships, relationships, relationships. The reason that I met Faith Evans was because I was interning on Hurricane Session, who I ended up working for Hurricane through the years and also picking up a lifelong client and friend, you know, through those relationships. So from 1999 to 2014, I've seen a lot with this man. He has taught me a whole lot, and it's an honor to be here with him today. Um, first things first here, we're going to show you guys a little bit of a video here that kind of accents the birth of the genre of this music. This is a journey into sound. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value. When all is ready, I throw this switch. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume. Pump up the volume. Everybody, if you got what it takes, cause I'm Curtis Blow and I want you to know that these are the breaks. Guys, as you saw in that video, what Hurricane is about to share with you is his life experience of watching that music birth in that manner. He's going to talk to you guys first a little bit about the early hip-hop methods of things. I'm going to turn over to him now. He's going to talk with you a little bit about these things. All right, all right. How y'all doing? And I must say that fool said I wish they had this school when I was growing up because I would have definitely been in here. It's a great school. So we're going to talk about hip-hop, um, the beginning turntables, of course. Um, me growing up in the 70s, I had older brothers and older sisters, and they always DJed. 
And um, on the turntables, of course, when you first had the turntables, only one turntable. So you had to get two turntables to actually mix a record. It was a big mixer in my house, probably about this big. And you had two turntables, but there was no headphones. So to make headphones, my brother would grab a telephone and break the end of it and do what he do and plug it in. And he'd actually be on the phone listening to it go left and right. You know, back then you had to pretty much be able to invent things because nowadays, I mean, back then you didn't have a lot of stuff, so you had to be able to coordinate your stuff. So the turntable itself, as far as hip-hop, that was definitely the beginning of being able to go from left to right on the turntable with the mixer in order to keep the MC going, if you understand what I mean when I say turntable. Turntable was very important back then, and I learned how to master it. Back then, my sisters and brothers, they used to just mix the record. They didn't scratch the record. So um, I was able to uh, get a hold of some cassette tapes, because back then, you know, it was no radio with hip-hop, so everything was pretty much hand-to-hand with cassettes, so you had to get yourself on a hip-hop cassette to learn a lot of stuff, so... I was able to get my hand on the cassette, and then I wanted to scratch. But I knew I had to get out the house because they wouldn't let me touch the turntables because I was too young. So turntables are very important. And then second off, you have the records. Um, With hip-hop, back then we didn't have our own beats, so we basically had the record shop for, say, a James Brown record or a Chic record. And in that record, it may have been a five-minute record But in that five-minute record, you have to find a beat that was solo for maybe 10 seconds or maybe even less. And once you find that beat, you'll put that beat, you'll buy two records because one record couldn't do you no good. You get two records and you put them on the turntables and you have to go back and forth and make sure that that beat keeps going while the MC, better known as the rapper nowadays, would rap over the beat. So that was our music back then, just two turntables, you find a beat, something similar to like Aerosmith, Walk This Way, remember that record? In the beginning it had that beat, and then next thing you know, if that beat go off, that crazy guitar comes in. You couldn't let that happen if you was a DJ and you had a guy on the mic, you had to be able to really keep that beat going. So um, I wanted to rap, so I had to go find me a DJ to help me keep that beat going because like I said my sisters and brothers they were just into mixing the record back then so with the records was very important you know nowadays you know nobody buys records no more but back then your collection was very important your collection of records was like your collection of beats that you make nowadays so the records was very important and um you know you can find anything from a, a Beatles to the Bee Gees to James Brown rap music was able to reach into all kinds of music, even jazz, and turn it into hip-hop, as long as they had that five seconds that we needed to make the thing keep going, if you know what I mean. And one of the unique things that he explained to me, guys, when I had first met Kane, was just the simple fact of digging for hours and hours and hours and hours trying to find a simple little loop of music to create something because they didn't have instruments. So one of the things he told me, I was like, wow, man, this is crazy. They used to take the labels and rip the labels off for the record. So if you had a nice beat going. You you didn't didn't want another DJ to come and look at your record and see what you was playing. So in order to protect your record, you had to scratch off the name of the band, the name of the record. So when they come looking at to see, oh, what's that beat? He couldn't see it because it was scratched off. You know, he had to go find it himself. So if he didn't have that juice to go find that beat, then that was just too bad, you know, so. And then, you know, he's going to talk to you guys next about how actually the DJ came before the MC, and he's going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the first notable um, um, MCs that he saw in the parks growing up in New York. Yeah, well, I'm from Hollis, Queens. Um, You know, hip-hop started in the Bronx, but it didn't take long for it to get to Queens. This is a matter of months at the, I could say at the most. So back then, um, it was guys like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five that I got my hand on the cassette and I would hear them rap over the beat back then. And another group called the Treacherous Three, which is pretty much like the Beastie Boys was three rappers. Treacherous Three was a big influence on them because if you listen to the Treacherous Three records back then, it's three MCs 
and they all going back and forth on the mic. You know, one guy may do four bars, the next guy may do four bars, which is pretty much the Beastie Boy kind of style, you know, Treacherous Three. So it was groups like that that definitely um, influenced us guys from Queens to go do our thing back then. So we need Spoonie G, all kind of guys from the Bronx. So we definitely give credit to those guys. And the next thing, the next slide we're going into, guys, he's going to talk about the importance of, of the neighborhood and the community of, of being involved in the music to help take it to the mainstream with, with local promotions and a little bit about his first group that he formed. Yeah, um, back in the 70s, there was a guy named Davey D. I don't know if you ever heard of him, Davey DMX, who wound up being a DJ for Curtis Blow. Uh, I lived on Hollis, say like 25th Street. He lived on like 215th Street. And um, when I first met him, he knew how to scratch. So I went to his house to watch him scratch so I can learn how to scratch. And we formed a group called Solo Sounds, which is actually the first hip hop group out of Hollis, Queens, before Run DMC was even a group. So um, Solo Sounds, what we would do to market ourselves back then, it was block parties. Block parties mean that you know you had houses on this side, and you had houses on this side, and then we would block off the street so no cars could come through, with say garbage cans or whatever, and um, then we would just start DJing out on the block, and everybody from the neighborhood would come to that block and party, and if we had cassettes at that time, we would sell the cassettes to everybody so that we would be known as a group, and that's how we got popular. And another element that stuck out to me the most of meeting Kane and hearing all these stories and, and being on the road and him talking about it to me was just as far as you hear all these things and it shows the love of the music that, 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 this, that this community had of how much music inspired people in the community right down to things like they didn't have power. So they'd splice in to street lights exactly. and run cables down to be able to get power or the park you know, to host to yeah. host the, mm -hmm. the, the block parties. And again, it's it's the love of music, and that's why everybody's here, right? So you know, it's, this genre of music is a very very cool component of, of, of that love. Yeah, as far as the, the rap battles went, it was more of a, rap was always a competitive game. So if one rapper thought he was good and he bragged about it. You know, then it was another rapper that was going to come and tell him, hey, I'm better than you. And then they'll go and battle on the mic. So, and you couldn't bite nobody's style. Like, you couldn't sound like nobody. You had to sound like yourself. Yeah, in today's time, let's, <laughs> that's what it is, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It'll be a lot of battles yeah, right hey, now. Hey, you're great. You sound like that guy. Right. That's the worst thing you, that could have happened back then is that you could have came out and sounded like somebody else. You'd just get killed. Like... You wouldn't be able to walk off the block. They'd be like, "Get him out of here, boo!" And, and the and the other one of the other cool elements is is about the the genre of this music is the style and all the other things that came around it. You know, as you saw in the video, I was telling Kane one of my favorite parts that always sticks out is the scene from Beach Street when the guys are kind of grooving across the street, you know, in their Adidas pants and whatnot, and just the style of it. And Kane can tell you a little bit just about, um, you know, the break dancing, you know, down to the graffiti that was involved in it as the backdrop. Right. You know, when it came to hip hop, you know, it was like you had the DJ, you had the MC, you had the break dancing, and you had the graffiti. So when you DJed in a park, you know, it was a, it was a certain time or a certain record that you would play that the break dancers would know it's our time to get busy, you know, and then they'll just form a circle and the break dancing battle will happen. You know, before rap music, it was more gangs in the neighborhood. So once rap music came into play in New York City, the gangs just left because everybody started getting into the music. So the breakdancing battles and then the graffiti was always the background because we couldn't have the corny backgrounds. So you had your graffiti artists that was really loving graffiti, then you had your breakdancers that loved breakdancers, then you had your DJs to rock the party, and then the DJs, which invented the MC, better known as the rapper, because the DJ would tell the rapper, hey, just get on the mic and just talk, just talk mess. Just brag about yourself. You know, talk about that. And that's how the MC came into play. And he already spoke to you guys a little bit. The next thing we're going to talk about here quickly to, to get into how it jumped into the mainstream was the, the importance of the first beatbox that was able to have a microphone in the front of it, a little mono microphone that they were able to set up and record these rap battles and whatnot in the neighborhood to put them on a mixtape. Kane can tell you a little bit about maybe one of his first experiences with that. 
Um, as far as the mixtape goes, it was more of a like even before the you know radios had this thing called the pause button, which you had to play, you had the record, you had the fast you know people used to actually put a cassette inside the radio and make their own music just using the pause button. If you understand what I mean, like you bam, 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 make your own pause button tape. Yeah, you guys call it the space bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was our space bar back then, and we were able to make cassette tapes. And it was very, nowadays they call them mixtapes, which is what they're doing, which is what we did. Like, like that piff, you know, all those, except these right. things were distributed hand to hand, which we're going to talk about a new business model that includes that as we get through this. So remember this element for sure. Yeah. Um, the next thing he's going to talk about is how those mixtapes ended up getting into the mainstream, which is the record executives. That Let's all give them a hand, right? Right. <laughs> all the record executives that would come in and hear this new genre of music, and it was such a had such a following and, and such an influence, you know, to the community, you know, they, which is where typically any art grows out of the community. And that's, again, one of the cool things about this genre of music. Um, Kane's going to tell you guys a little bit about some of the first signed artists and some of the fir first labels that were out there. Yeah, um, some of the first labels out there was, of course, was Sugar Hill, Enjoy, Tough City. Um, Curtis Blow signed with Mercury, which was the first major label to actually sign a rap artist, which was Curtis Blow. Um, Russell Simmons, who grew up in my neighborhood, I grew up with Run DMC and Russell Simmons. We all grew up in the same small neighborhood. He was the manager of Curtis Blow, so he was able to uh, get him a record deal with a major label back then. Russell was always a hustler. Like, he always hustled to get money. He was very good at speaking with people hand to hand and always was good at getting on the phone and making things happen. So he made that happen for Curtis Blow, and Curtis Blow wound up getting really big off of that. So then all of a sudden, all these other labels start realizing that this rap thing could really go. They didn't really think it would last. It was more like calling it a fad. But um, once they seen it continuously kept making money, then all of a sudden, here comes the radio. Here comes everything else into play. And the next thing we're going to talk about, guys, is, is one of the coolest parts to me. From, from where it hit mainstream for, for Hurricane, he's going to talk to you guys a little bit about his first involvement with the major music, uh, the big time is what we call it. His first experience with the big time for this genre of music. And remember when he's telling you this stuff, guys, this is when this music was first born. It's one of the newest types of music out there outside of electronic music that we all know and that you guys probably listen to on the way over here. But it's, it's, really, it's really neat to hear him talk about this stuff. So he, he's gonna tell you guys a little bit about his first experience um, in the in the big time. Well, I would say my first really big experience was probably the Raising Hell tour, which was uh, Run DMC, LL Cool J, Houdini, and the Beastie Boys. We all went on a world tour that was unbelievable back then because back then you know it was hard to get hip hop into venues because they was always uh, saying that it was a violent um, music. But they, they didn't really understand it pretty much. So going on that tour, you know, we toured all across the world with that tour. And the amazing thing about that was, you know, going to these other countries and people that didn't even speak English, like we couldn't even ask them a simple question and they couldn't give us back the answer. But if we played that record, they knew all the words, all the words to the song, which was really crazy, you know. Like, you know, can I ask you a question? And like they speak in... Japanese, but if you play that song, the whole entire audience knew all the words. So once we start seeing that in 86, you know, we are we really knew that we can definitely be And still successful. to this day, I travel to Japan uh, once a year, and, and my first time going over there with Kane, I go over there, and, and that style and that, that era of hip-hop still influences their culture more than you could imagine. It's like the kid that picked us up at the airport that knew you. Yeah. I mean, he had the fat rope chain. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looked like he was out of Beach Street, yeah. you know? Incredible. And he could barely carry on a conversation with us, but he knew everything about Hurricane. This kid, yeah, I, those guys if we had more time, we could sit up here and laugh about him for the entire time. Yeah, the one guy, um, uh, I don't know if you've seen Pharrell lately with that big hat Pharrell wears. Back in 86, that's the only hat they wore. 
Like, I got pictures of those guys with that same hat on. And you were like, wow, yeah, they was wearing that. That, that was their hat back then. And then, and then from there, guys, in that tour, um, the next thing Kane's going to introduce you guys is a groundbreaking hip-hop album that was released and really hit the mainstream and broke down barriers to, to hit and, and what we call in the business crossover, you know, into, into the markets, into all different types of culture. Yeah, uh, of course, it was the Raising Hell album with Run DMC, you know, with Walk This Way. That was the uh, first really crossover big rock mixed with rap record. And um, they did Rock Box before then, which was also mixed with rock, but it wasn't as big as Walk This Way. But that album sold a lot of records for the first time as far as the album goes with uh, rap music. Then, of course, uh, Beastie Boys, 1987, Licensed the Ill Tour, you know, that was a very huge record, and it was number one. I can't remember how long it was number one, but it broke records also. And um, License to Ill, of course, we went on tour around the world again, probably about four or five times, and um, it was unbelievable. I got to keep those how stories. Many, to yeah, myself. how many hotel rooms did y'all tear up during that time, and how, yeah. how did the check-in process work for y'all every time you went to a hotel? We got banned from a lot of hotels. <laughs> Put it this way, like... We had to actually change our names. Like, we was Fuzzy Zola and, you know, Bill Weatherme. Like, we never would tell a hotel our real name when it was time to check in. We'd hide the tour bus behind the um, hotel, send the manager around there. He'd give them a list of just false names because if they knew it was us, they wasn't letting us in the hotel. And the thing of that, think of uh, when you get out of here, all you that want to be a road manager, think of an artist walking up to you and saying, hey, here's our list of fake names. Now go make it happen. Yeah, uh, but well, back then... And then tell them no and watch what happens. Yeah, back then, you didn't have to go to the desk and get ID or nothing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just... Thanks to you guys, we got to do that now. We appreciate that. Hey, well... <laughs> and, then, and then, guys, the next tour he's going to talk about is another great big tour, again, that broke down boundaries, is, is the Together Forever tour. Oh, yeah, that tour was huge. That was um, at the height of Run DMC and also Beastie Boys. And also Davy D, which I talked about earlier. So on that tour, I was on stage with all three acts. Um, I was rapping and DJing with Davy D. We would get on the turntables and do this. We invented this thing called a cipher, which he would scratch back and forth. Then I'd come right behind him, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then after we go off stage, I'd come and DJ for the Beastie Boys and do that thing. Then Run DMC would come on, and I was like a Flavor Flav type guy with them. So I was on stage on all three groups, and um, I was tired. By the time I ended the tour, I was tired. I, I had to cut off the Run DMC part because by the time I finished with Davey and the Beasties, I was just too tired to go up there with them by the time the middle of the tour was going on. But that tour was huge because it was a, the first ever big white rap group and the biggest uh, black rap group together on tour, and that tour lasted, it seemed like, for a lifetime. That's one of, that is one of the cool things about music that I just want to add is the fact that it, it, there is no color to music. There is no boundaries. Right. It's, 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 a, it's a mutual love that people have for, for this, I always say, this stupid little three minutes of music that it just it connects people, and it does. It breaks down barriers, and it always has. So. Always. Even if it's not hip-hop, music has always been like a healing process. And tell them a little bit about the Afros. Well, the Afros was developed in 1990 by Jam Master J, Russell Simmons, myself, Davey D, and uh, my band Cool T. Um, of course, those was like the solo sound guys also. So we just was pretty much on some have a fun type group. And uh, we just came up with the idea. And the next thing you know, we had a really big hit record. And next thing you know, we were on tour again. You know, my life was just, my tours just wouldn't stop for me. You know, I was getting wore out. I was like, another tour? Okay, let's go. And the Afros is one of those fun groups. We had a great time. And next we got uh, my solo album on Grand Royal Records called The Horror. Grand Royal Records was... Uh, Started by the Beastie Boys, and it was and it was actually one of the first kind of imprints that a hip hop group had done on their own, wasn't it? One, wasn't it one yeah, of the first ones. It was definitely one of the, up there, one of the first. I'm not sure if it was the exact first, but one of the first for sure. 
And um, I was able, like I said before, I always knew how to write raps and I knew how to DJ. I just happened to know how to do both. So Beastie Boys, um, you know, I used to co-write some of their stuff. So they liked me as far as rap and they asked me to record an album on their label. I was like, cool, let's do it. And again, I'm going to reflect on that, guys, and explain to each and every one of you in this room that you need to know each other. Because you hear all the work this man's gotten just based off relationships. Relationships are everything. You know, his career has continued to grow, and especially for mine. So I want to let you know that don't leave this school without talking to each other. Get these people's contacts. Stay in touch with each other and shake the person's hand sitting next to you. Don't be too cool because you're not. You all yeah. need each other when you get out of here. I can grant you that. Especially in entertainment, you know, meeting people is very important. You know, however you meet a person, the impression that you leave is going to let that person know if that person wants to do business. Which when I first met Brad, he oh, was... Wait a minute. Hold up. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> he was, no, 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 no. Really, he was a humble kid. He just got out of college. He was quiet. He didn't get in your way. And, um, you know, he had to swallow... Because when I was in the studio... I was with a couple of other guys in the studio who was a little bit more uh, rough on you, right? Yeah, they were the goons, as I would call <laughs> But, you know, you took it and look at you now. That's I right. mean, I introduced him to uh, Faith Evans, and I, re I actually recommended him. You know, when you recommend somebody, you know, that's like your word. You know, somebody asks you, like, hey, how was such and such? And if you say that person is pretty good and that person goes with that person and really just screws you up, that person's not going to take your word anymore. And Brad is the man. Oh, well, thank you, brother. Thank you. I feel the same way about you. <laughs> and since then, guys, the relationship thing, my relationship grew with Faith is working in the studio with her, and I ended up growing up the ranks from doing that to getting an A&R credit to being an executive on the record to running her tours and now being a partner in her imprint, and we were up for um, R&B Album of the Year for the Grammys this year. Um, on our own label, our own imprint. Um, and the next thing he wants to talk to you guys about is another one of my favorite, is the fashion and the, and the brands that, that came along with, with the yeah. 80s hip-hop. Yeah, as you can see, you know, back then we were wearing gold chains, Adidas, which I still wear. The velour hats, how they came into play in Hollis, Queens, was the older guys, the older men, used to wear those hats, like my uncle first gave me his hat, and that's how Run DMC started wearing those hats, because in Hollis, Queens, guys from Hollis wore shell toe Adidas with the leather pants and those hats, so that wound up being a very big fashion statement when that was happening, and you know, we had the Cazelles, I don't know if they wearing Cazelles now, right? Yeah, Cazelles are back. You know, back then, everybody was wearing Cazelles. If you had a pair of Cazelles on, that meant a lot. It's like you had a fur coat. <laughs> You know, Cazelles was expensive, they were colorful, they had blue ones to go with your blue sweater, with your blue Adidas. You had to definitely coordinate what you was doing. So the style was very important. You couldn't be a DJ or an MC, you know, coming looking like a clown. You had to really be straight so they know that you real hip hop, you know. So and the famous gold chains. Oh yeah, we talked about the gold chains. I mean, they weigh, you know. <laughs> I had so many gold chains back then that if I was walking down a hallway in a hotel, you could hear me coming because it was like ching, 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 you know. So chains, like, I think that's why I have a big neck now because that was like exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, shell to Adidas, as you can see, Adidas finally came on board after Run DMC made my Adidas. Back then, getting um, people like Pepsi or Coca-Cola or sneaker deals, they wasn't easy to come by because, you know, still you had to convince these big companies that hip-hop music was going to still be around. You know, back then, they didn't think that was going to happen. They think it was like a four or five-year thing and it was rap. But Adidas came on board and gave the deal. And um, the hats, as you can see, the baseball hats to the back, the shades, the Adidas sweaters, the Kango hat, all that stuff was a big play for you as far as being um, a good dresser back then. You know, now look at me, I got the plaid shirt on and I'm just a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the slang is what he, it just took a little bit on that. You know, I bet you, what, what word would you think that, that they still use today that you guys invented out of the neighborhood? Uh, so many, what, chill out? Chill out, yeah, it's that know. simple. Chill, chill out. out, you know. Not chillax, but chill out. Chill People out. Have, you know, back then, you know, yeah, back then you had to have that slang. So when you get on the mic, you know, you know what to say. 
So you can relate to everybody in the neighborhood. So you had to know the slang. And you have to invent slang. Slang is inventing words also. As you can see nowadays, y'all still invent these words. So very important. And then, you know, again, back, we're, we're, talk, we're going to reflect a little bit more on as far as is the promotion side of it and, and the first appearances of hip-hop to the mainstream. And he's going to talk to you guys a little bit about those appearances and features. Yeah, um, back then, you know, getting on the TV show was really big. You had Dick Clark's show, which was the American Bandstand. And uh, we was probably like the first rap group to get on the American Bandstand. As you can see, my man MCA is on the floor. What is he doing? <laughs> You know, we was pretty wild. Then, of course, you had Yo! MTV Raps with Fab Five Freddy. That was pretty big back then to get on that show. Um, uh, Soul Train was huge back then. If you can get on Soul Train, that was really big because everybody really respected Don Cornelius back then. So getting on those shows was really big. And we didn't have a lot of uh, magazines that we can get into, but magazines like Right On was a very big magazine to get into. Um, they had another magazine like Word Up magazine. It wasn't many. It was probably like three of them. But if you was in that magazine, that means you pretty much made it because um, they knew who you was. And then the next thing is just that we. This is a. It's a little redundant, but we we want to as we go through the presentation, we want to let you guys know the importance of touring. You know, touring the jobs is a lot of touring uh, jobs out there. So we kind of reflected a little bit here of how important the, the, the tour is to support an album. Yeah, you know, um, without a tour, you know, it's very hard to really get your music, you know, really, really huge across the world, not just in your neighborhood. You know, you can be big in your neighborhood and think you're a really big artist, you know, but then when you go outside your neighborhood, you know, nobody knows you, nobody knows your record, you're going to be like, wow, I thought I was big. So touring is very important because it puts you in front of all kind of people that might not know you. Or if they do know you and they see you performing, now they feel like they can touch you and they can understand where you're coming from more. So getting on tour, not only that, seeing the world. I mean, I went to Jerusalem. I never thought I'd go to Jerusalem. You know, I'm in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified and I'm walking the steps where he walked, you know, and I'm like, wow, I'm all over the world. Right? That's right, all over the world. And then the in stores, guys, which is another thing that we all know in today's time has completely went away. You know, it's, it, it's ter Tower Records, all, most of all the major retail stores have closed down because the music industry has lost product. We no longer have a product to sell. You go online and you download a digital version of something. There is no product to push. So the in-stores have obviously disappeared today, but Kane's going to tell you a little bit about the importance of showing up to the, to the record stores in the neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, it's always important to be uh, visual and nice to your fans. So back then, we was always go into different cities. And as soon as we go to that city, we go to the first record store, which is more likely a mom and pop store is what they called them. So we would always go to the in-store, sign autographs, um, give away some records, and it was always important to touch that fan so that fan was continually be a fan. So in stores is very important. And, you know, in today's times, they've turned into meet and greets. You know, you do it yeah. at the concert, mm -hmm. you get VIP packages, and the fans are able to come back and, and har harass people like me to, right. to meet All them. of that is a part of marketing and promoting yourself. So if yeah. you're into that and, in this school. And, and you got to remember, it's nonstop. You know, you work, 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 and you're on the stage an hour. Absolutely. You, know, you transfer everybody from place to place, meet and greet, this and that. And a lot of people find out that, that the road is a very tough place, and you have to make it fun, tour with good people, and, you know, look after one another. And so. keep your sanity, because waking up every day in a different city can really... It's confusing, confusing. especially having to wake everybody up. Especially being on stage in Detroit, and you walk out and say, hello, New York. Right, that happens too. <laughs> And that then, has happened before to everybody. <laughs> and, and then the next thing he's going to talk to you guys about is, you, I know you all probably listen to a lot of mix shows on the radio now. He's going to talk to you guys a little bit about the on-air radio stations that, that were back that kind of brought hip-hop again to the mainstream. Yeah, um, back in the days, you know, hip-hop wasn't really allowed on the radio. But then finally we had a guy by the name of Mr. Magic that got on the radio in New York and another guy by the name of DJ Red Alert. And pretty much, if they played your record, then you knew that you had a big record. 
because it's on the radio. You know, you be drive. It's no longer just on your cassette tape. Now you can turn on the radio, and there you go. So back then, Red Alert, Mr. Magic, they were very important in breaking a lot of old school records by, you know, opening the doors and putting it on the radio. So that was very important. And uh, the next thing before we're getting ready to segue into another portion of the discussion, but he's going to just kind of explain, not in great detail, but and not, of course, how much money they took out of your pocket, but the way that the money was made for everybody to take. He's going to talk to you guys a little bit about the early revenue streams. Right. You know, as far as the early revenue streams, you know, you had your cassette tapes that you sell. You know, back then, you know, publishing... If you didn't know about publishing, then you wouldn't know that you're supposed to get checks. And my first attorney told me, if you don't ask, they won't tell. Exactly. You know, so it's very important, man, when you write your song, make sure you um, sign up with ASCAP or BMI. So if that song is placed somewhere, you know, you can go to the mailbox and your check is there. You know, I've done a lot of stuff for like movies and you know, to this day, every time they show that movie on HBO or something, I get a check in the mail because I see that movie, Kiss the Girls, or I see Tupac's movie, Above the Rim, and I know I did music for that stuff. So, you know, when you see that, you know, oh, a check is coming. So it's very important to get that. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and, and doing all those things he's talking about, guys, registering your music, getting things out there. If BMI and ASCAP or CSAC does not know that your music is registered, they can't track it. Exactly. They can't track it. So... You know, the radio play portion of it, you know, there's a system they use now called BDS that tracks the spins. And if your music is not registered and you don't have your stuff out there, they're not going to pay you. So if you're mad about not getting paid, you should point that finger at yourself most of the time because a lot of artists do not take those business steps to make sure they cover their ends to get paid. And a lot of the times that's why they don't get paid. Exactly. Um, and, of course, merchandising on the tour. Kane can tell you probably. I can only oh, yeah. imagine how many T-shirts. Oh, man, so. merchandising was very, very huge, and it still is now. You know, you'd be surprised how much money an artist can make just off T-shirts, you know, T-shirts and hats and buttons. You know, back then, you know, fans were buying up everything. So the merchandising is very big. You know, it's very big to create your own logo, or if you're managing somebody, or if you're into entertainment and you know somebody you want to manage, you know, one of the first things you should do is create a logo for that person because that logo can sell like crazy. Even if he's not big, people may like that logo, and that logo would be very big as far as merchandising goes. You know, look at Rockefeller, look at Sean John, look at Fat Farm. All that stuff is, you know, putting in your face because you constantly see it, that logo. So it's very important. Like that Met hat, that New York sign right there, that L.A. hat, all them logos. So it's very important as artists to get them logos going. And then, of course, the branding back then, there wasn't a whole lot of mainstream brands, as he said, you know, that were participating in music in general. And, of course, artists thought they were too cool for it, you know, back then. And, you know, one of the one of the earliest ones it might not be the first but earliest was the branding with adidas and um yeah. run dmc they had a song yeah my adidas which was on a raising hell record um actually adidas had came to a show in madison square garden they had heard about the record but they still was acting kind of funny style so russell got them to come to the madison square garden show and um run grabbed the mic right before my adidas and told everybody put their adidas up and you had like but 20,000, over 20,000 people had Adidas on and they all put them up in the air. And when they seen that, they finally caught on. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you beat them over the head with it long enough. They right. typically will eventually get it. Yes. Um, and, and again, remember that because as we segue into something that the three of us have created that is a new model, branding is one of the main things that we do to support our efforts. Um, and then, of course, film and TV placement. Yeah, film and TV placement, uh, Crush Groove. I don't know how many of y'all have seen Crush Groove, but if you haven't seen Crush Groove or B Street or Wild Style, you should definitely go see that movie because those movies are pretty much like the creation of hip-hop back in the days. So if you haven't seen those movies, I would say get some popcorn and some butter you know, with a soda or something, whatever you do, and sit down and, and laugh because it's, it's kind of funny, too, when you look at it back then how, you know, everybody was dressing, how everybody was acting, and how hip-hop, you know, began. So I would say definitely check that out. And um, what we're going to get into next, guys, is we're going to just talk very briefly about the digital age method because 
we could probably flip this conversation and y'all could probably tell us more about the digital age me method than, than we know because you guys, you know, you guys in this room, honestly, I mean, seriously, you guys birthed a lot of it. You know, the way that you guys communicate with each other and stuff now, hell, I can't keep up with it. You know, I, it, but, but it does amaze me the reach and the way that things can be done in this method. And this digital age method, you know, now it ain't in the community. It isn't. I'm from Mississippi. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> it isn't in the. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it isn't um, in the in the parks and stuff anymore. You know, it's it's all online. There are no record stores. You can't you can't wait to Tuesday to go run out and buy that record, because if you don't go out and buy it on Tuesday, guess what? You might not have it. You might not be the person listening to that record. So you know, it's all gone digital. And even to the creation. I mean, yeah. I mean, a computer here in front of you that we could make a track for you right now and start rapping on it. It's like digital is now. It's like a race. Like, right when you think you got the most update stuff, next week somebody else got something that's different. You're like, yeah. what's that? And, and the way it's released, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it can make or break overnight. You know, it's, it, and it, I remember the first album I released that I worked so hard on to watch people poo-poo it in my face online. And, and, and But there's the other half that love it. And it's like, finally, you're like, really? You know, they said that about my music? Right. You know, and it's just like it's given everybody a forum to express their opinion. You know, and again, I'm going to stress to you enough, I wish I could say what I really wanted to say, but they're filming. Keep the horse off of your social media because people look at it, we see it, and if you're on there clowning and acting like an idiot, do you think somebody's gonna wanna employ you? No, because I'm gonna tell you, you're not at the Beastie Boy stage leaving the school where you can throw TVs out a window and people still pay you. You know, you're starting out in a method to where they wanna know, can you get up? Can you show up to work on time? And as how much crap can you take from an artist you know i'm pointing why are you pointing at me <laughs> because i just look at you because i'd love to go into some of the stories of the things that you guys used to do hey to me. listen but <laughs> it was for the better you know sometimes hey, you gotta it made have me strong you gotta have rough gotta have skin in this skin. business you, you know? definitely do people was hard on me in the beginning too you know i could have easily said i quit and left you know yep. it's been a and, lot and, of and that's the thing don't don't uh, you know the quitting thing one of the uh, all the panels i've spoke on and all the students i've been blessed to be around that you know and 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 talk to that are starting this out one of the best questions I was ever asked on a panel him and I were sitting on was somebody raised their hand they were like wow did you ever feel like quitting and I thought about it and I was like no not at all you know because that's what I wanted to do I loved it that much and right. again that, that's that's the point of getting out of here I always say you must be present to win the reason I got the work in the beginning is because I was there the studio manager had to kick me out of the studio and tell me you got to go home you got to sleep you got to get out you know, so, so it is important. And the other thing that one of the next topics we want to go into in this digital age method is, you know, he was talking to you guys about how they found beats to rap on back then. You know, they had to go dig for, go to the record store and dig for hours in crates. And not only dig, drop it on the plate, play the record. You to listen, find, listen to it. find the break beat. Mm -hmm. And listen then now what do you do? You, you go online and there's websites where you can lease music you can buy a track and and a lot of it's really good theo lodge one of, he's over here in the corner one of the artists we're working with in our program right now a lot of his music he's got this community of people which i'll get into this online community of people to where he's able to go out and find great tracks and even explain to a producer what kind of track he might need you know to complete his album uh, you know for albums that people still create so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really unique thing of how that all works. Um, and then, of course, the online blogs and stuff. You know, when, when Hurricane and these guys left the neighborhoods, they weren't able to maintain the relationship unless they came back to the block party in the neighborhood. They couldn't tweet to their buddy, oh, my gosh, I just saw Treacherous 3 in the park. I mean, could you imagine? Oh, that? no, come on. I mean, did you, and did you really think that, Today we'd be sitting here being able to say that. Oh man, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can do nowadays. But it seems like to me, people get in trouble more on Twitter than they do anything. Every man, time I look up, keep, somebody's keep the getting garbage in trouble off. on Tell Twitter. Me. Yeah, but, I had this for breakfast. Okay, that's weird to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I ate my breakfast and went to work. Um, all right, guys. The next thing we're going to go into. Us three up here, to the right of me, is a very special guest of mine, Canes, and he has, 
we're, we are honored to have him up here and, and involved in our business method of this company that we've created called Play Pro Media. And this company, I created it in 2010 um, based off a lot of the things that he has talked about and I experienced through my career and through, I've sold, I've, to this day, I've been involved in the sale of over 8 million records and I've toured on three major world tours and been involved in every genre of music from, you know, from hip hop to country. I've lived in Nashville. I've traveled all over the place because again, I have a, a special love for any genre of music, especially music that tells a story. That's why I like hip hop and country so much. Um, and we created this method because we all saw how fast it was changing. And we thought, well, how can we slow it down a little bit and create something that, that you know, uses the industry professionals and uses um, techniques of basic, basic music business practice, which is production. And of course, I always stress this, you can produce, you can do whatever you want, but if you don't have financing behind it, you're like every other kid that has a laptop and uh, I don't know what keyboard, the oxygen keyboard was the one that we were using, but yeah. he's laughing because he's like, yeah, that's like 20 years old. <laughs> um, but you know, and, and that's the thing, the financing is a very, very important part. And of course, marketing and branding, you know, and, and marketing branding is such a, a broad term in today's time. And we, we all know about distribution, you know, distribution, like I said, is now online, it used to be on shelves. So now shelf space is infinite. You know, there's infinite shelf space out there to put music out there, and there's way more music being recorded than heard and sold. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the method that we've created using all the methods that Hurricane has talked to you about, and I've been blessed to chime in with on him. And we've created this method, and guys, this is... I'm going to introduce him on the next slide, forgive me. This, this thing is not is my... that guy? Yeah. <laughs> this is my best guy here. Um, we're going to talk about this method here. What we've basically done, guys, is something real unique. Um, we have created a national music community market, and it's allowed us to be able to discover, create, and promote music nationally. And what we've done is we have set up a method where we have college housing communities, and there's 37,000 kids living in these housing, housing communities, communities across 68 markets. And, you know, Kane, you know, it's kind of, from hearing from him, it was kind of like the community. It's a community thing, you know, but what it's allowed us to do was not create one community in Hollis, Queens, but 68 of them across the nation that, who does everybody want to reach? College kids, right? Everybody. Everybody wants to reach college kids. So you got anything to add to that or should keep going? I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said back before, you know, the block parties where everybody stays, pretty much the college community, it's that young vibe, that energy. So basically what Play Pro is doing is reaching all those communities at the college, just like the block parties back then, and coming into the college communities and creating a block party all over again and doing hand-to-hand -hand with everybody as far as marketing and promotion and everything. So that's pretty much what you, where yeah, you're going That's at. That's where we're going. Right. And what we've done in, in that community is we've created a thing called the, the Play Pro Media Nation. And in that nation, when I set up this company, again, I knew I obviously needed financing and I needed a way to market and distribute because discovery, again, I could get online and play you 100 bands and you could listen to them all day long. But out of that 100, you might find one, and Dr. Lowe's going to talk to you guys about this. Um, but we created the PPM Nation, and, and what you see on this map, these pinpoints are, they're college housing communities. And what our company has done is we've retained the special event rights to these properties, which allows us to do what? Host a block party on it for all the college kids. It's um, allowed us to market and brand whatever we want across that property as long as it isn't completely offensive. You know, we're able to brand the basketball courts. We're able to brand the swimming pools. We're able to brand all kinds of things across here, you know, to help support our music efforts. Um, you know, and we also do company structured externships that we work with young people like yourselves in these markets to help in these efforts. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we keep going. Um, the area that it's drawn to, we've set up a website called playpromedia.com. And 
we basically through our PPM nation, all our people are promoting for us. They're promoting for us. Well, guess where we're driving the traffic? Back to our website. Why do I want to give it to Twitter? Why do I want to keep building their brand? We work with people like you. Imagine if everybody in here tweeted what we were doing right now. And in a positive way, of course, tweeted that. The reach of that, it's very strong and it's very, very impactful. Then you go a step further and we leave here and start looking at all your friends, your friends, your friends, your friends. And we start leveraging, you know, that, that social media effort. And then you create what they call a viral spin. Um, and we create our online communities within playpromedia.com. And we're going to show you guys a video here of similar to what you saw in the first part of the presentation, but with a little updated twist on it. Money, I hope will go a long way. Real and feeling, moving, this is time to get my drink on. Nothing's gonna stop me, made my mind up, tired of freak on. If you got a moment, come on, girls, and get your greed on. You know where to find me, I'm the one to sing in this song. Dreams up, hands up, everybody fight tonight. Right, left to right, everybody here having fun tonight. Dreams up, hands up. Play pro Check out playpromedia.com and play on. Yeah. <laughs> so there, guys, is the kind of version of what we've created based off all those elements that we've talked to y'all about, you know. And for us, it's been a long journey to get it to this point to where, as you see, we have a community full of people. And right. what we focus on is finding new music because right. when I, that's one of, and I know speaking for Kane, too, it's one of my favorite things to do. I love music at the early stages. I love working with young-minded people. Exactly, because they're hungry and they want to succeed. That's, That's like right. the guy over here say he's into entertainment. Well, this guy over here may be an artist. You may have another guy over there that's the engineer. So you got the guy that's in the entertainment. You got the guy that's in the marketing. You got the guy that's a rapper. If you put your heads together, boom, there you go. Everybody. Yeah, and you, you guys really think about what he just said. Seriously, do you know how many people are on this campus that do all of that? I'm telling you, yeah. network, network, network. And don't do it online. Meet these people. Come to these events like this because the uh, Full Sail works really hard for you guys to put these kind of events together. I can tell you from touring of how hard it is to coordinate these things. And they're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for y'all. And if you don't take advantage of it, you're doing yourself a big disservice and you're, you, you're going to fall behind. You're going to fall behind the next guy that did show up, that did participate, that did shake the person's hand, that did walk out of here knowing like, wow, if I got one thing, I know I need to step up my game on talking to people and getting to know people on this campus. So where we've created our communities, guys, is on our website, playpromedia.com. It's our content aggregator and it is our community. And it's where we basically host all of our stuff that we do, all the music that we find that we want to feature. So if we've got featured music on our site and we ask all of y'all to tweet to check out this artist, guess where we drive them to? Back to our site. Why would I want to send it anywhere else? Seriously, why? Why would you? You need the hit. And what, what we do is then we take the hit, the website hit, and we resell it to a brand. Um, the other really neat part about it is in all 68 of our markets, we set up things called groups. And we do a group setting that this fine gentleman over here to the next to me that I'm about to finally get to introduce to you guys, um, he taught me a lot about this stuff. And we built a system basically that, for instance, in one market, everything that we have going on surrounding that market, we're able to post it and host it in the same place. So everybody goes to the same place to get all the same information. And then you got another group in another market. 
Well, guess what? They can look at the same information. We got acts in this market. We got acts in this market. We're able to connect them through these groups, and we're able to monitor it. And then what we're also able to do is what? The analytics. We're able to take all the analytics, and we're able to show a brand that we've got traffic. We're getting recognized. You know, I even almost leave the labels out, and the labels can see that our artists, like Macklemore and those guys. Right. You know, you know the good those... thing about Play Pro also is for the students is that even when you're in school, you actually get to do what you in school to do. You actually get to touch it. You know what I mean? So if you're in the marketing and we do one of these events with Brad, we'll have you a job doing marketing for that event to make that event big. You know, if you're an engineer, it's an opportunity that you can come in and engineer a session while you're still in school. So by the time you're out of school, you already have some kind of experience of actually doing these things so that when you do you're out of school, it's not like, you, you know, you out there in the world now, you don't know how to do it, you know. So it definitely helps out as far as being hands on. Absolutely. And right now, guys, we're, I'm going to embarrass some people in here. We're, we're actually on campus right now running this model here. We have a property here in Orlando called The Lofts. And my team is over here to the left. Artists, everybody stand up and say hello to everybody. Oh. I said stand up. Come on, don't be shy. Put them on the spot, B. That's, that's, welcome to the party. And these guys are currently working on this event right now. They're involved in, I don't know who's not shy and wants to say something. Do you, Lewis, get up, anybody? Get up and tell them one thing you've learned. That's <laughs> We're going to not mess with Brittany. Go ahead, Al. I mean, I ain't really got a whole lot to say about it. He pretty much nailed everything on here, man. Uh, it's a really, really, really good company. I'm very honored and excited to actually be a part of this whole thing, regardless of how it ends up. But uh, the thing he just had up, the uh, Hoops and Hits 2.0, is going to be a big event. I definitely expect everybody to be there, to be there pretty much. But... Um, What's, what's, one of, what's one of the main things that stuck out to you as far as what you've learned? What, what, what's one of the main Marketing, elements? Marketing, uh, getting, getting your name out there any way you can. I did a lot of on-feet stuff. I walked around. I might have even talked to some people when here. But uh, it's basically marketing and um, getting a name out there pretty much. Uh, we did a lot of social media. Like I said, on foot, social media, uh, any way you possibly can. Get your name out there. And they taught us a lot about that. And All right, thank you. I'll get over there. Definitely showed us a lot of stuff too. Yeah, uh, I'm about to get to him too because they just gave me the. And you know what's so fade. cool about what he just said when he said he's walking, doing hand to hand. You know, I I watched Russell Simmons actually do that in the neighborhood. Yep. I watched him walk around handing out flyers, knocking on the door to the clubs, wanting to do parties. You know, that's how he started. So that's a that's a beautiful thing. All right, guys. Um, now I want to introduce to y'all. Um. A very, very special guest that has been a very big influence in my life uh, in this new journey that I've, I've come upon. And, and Kane and I, I mean, really, Kane and I hang around a lot of cool people. And being around this gentleman has been one of the coolest things that I've been able to be around. Because what he, what he shares with people and what he's created is, is unbelievable. This is Terry Lowe. We call him he, Dr. Terry Lowe. We call him Dr. T. Lowe. You guys give him a hand. He is the director. Kind of look over to the screen here because I don't want to use up a lot of his time ex explaining uh, all the wonderful things he's done. He's, he's the director for the Center for Professional Selling at KSU, and he's founded this thing called the National Collegiate Sales Competition. And guys, it's one of the coolest sales things that I have ever been to. And I, when I saw it, it brought a whole new light of what the selling process really, really is about. And I'm going to turn it over to our, our special guest, Dr. Lowe, and let him talk to you guys a little bit about the philosophy of selling. Yes, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome, brother. I know the whole time you've been sitting there saying, who is that guy up there? <laughs> He's not saying anything. I, I've learned a lot. It's been really cool. I've, I've had a chance to come down uh, in January and meet with the with the class and the students and the, and the team that's working on the project now and this this is one of the uh, coolest things in the world. Uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. So what have, why am I here? As you've seen uh, the business model for what you guys are doing what you're going into has changed. Uh, Hurricane and Brad have talked about it. You've seen it. Uh, you've experienced it. 
<laughs> so how do you go about uh, engaging that? How do you go about doing it? Uh, and they've talked a lot about building relationships. And, and I tell this to all my students when I do consulting with companies. Relationships and networking and, and understanding what you're trying to accomplish is so important. So how do you do that? What, what's the skill set that you need in order to develop relationships? And you think, well, there, there are people who are born to be salespeople and they're outgoing, et cetera. Well, there's some skills that you, you can learn. And for you to survive when you go out now, uh, as you know, it's, uh, you know, to make it to the big stage, to the make it to the big show, uh, there's not that many people who are going to be able to do that. So if you want to be around what you're doing right now, you have to develop a skill set that allows you to do that. You still want to, want to have a, be a part of the dream that you've had all your life. Uh, I'm the same way. I actually I can't believe I'm getting paid to do what I do right now. Uh, and here's something that's, that's special. Here, this, is, this is something you have to uh, understand. What we're trying to do, what you want to do, what companies want to do. And I, and I guess I, I look at it, uh, I'm, I grew up there, during the rap era uh, and the hip-hop era. And so I remember all this. I didn't wear much of it. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I do remember all that going on. Uh, so it, it's a... Uh, uh, and being around artists, the few I have, and the time I've been around Brad uh, and the people he works with, there's something that I've, I've found out in listening to the, all the old artists, even from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then listen, just listening to these guys talk. They didn't start out in music to make money. I mean, they, that might have been in the back of their mind. But what they're doing is a passion. It's something they really want to do, something they enjoy doing. And there's a reward for other people listening to your music. And it changing their lives. You're right. You just hit it around the nose. We got paid White Castle hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> so we was doing it for passion. But yeah. I just had to say that. Yeah, but anytime you find something that you're really good at, people will reward you for it. Now, you do have to get a lawyer nowadays to make sure you do get rewarded for it. But that's, that's the center of being really, really good, being a world-class performer at anything. And here's what I found out, and I listen to these artists. They have a passion. They, they have a vision for what they want to happen. And you probably, all you guys right now probably have an idea and a goal in mind of where you want to be, what you want to do, and you can picture yourself. There's a, you, you can see it. And so there's a mission statement within you of what you want to be and what you want to be about. Funny thing is, only the most successful people in the world, in, in all walks of life, they have that vision. And it's no different for, for companies. There's lots and lots of research on, on the companies who have outperformed all the other companies in their industry over 30, 40, 50 years. And that central difference, the characteristic that made them different, the company themselves, is that they had a, 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 a driving purpose in their life in the, in the culture of the company, beyond just making money. They believed they were doing something that made a difference in the lives of people and the customers that they have. So it's important for you to fully understand what it is that you're about and to be successful in some of the how-tos to get past, uh, you know, you're, if you're in production, you're in engineering, you're an artist, you know, you've got to get together. You've got to work together. And there are some how-tos and a process to do that. So how do you do it? And, and Brad said something earlier about wanting to quit and not quitting. Well, there, there is actually a scientific process in understanding how you work with other people. And the process of, of try, trying to find an artist is no different from trying to find um, uh, somebody who, to represent you or to, to, uh, to sponsor your program. And these guys right here, they've been out talking to lots and lots of companies. Uh, and you're going to, it's, and I'm an old jock, an old baseball player, so I always relate it to batting. If I fail seven times out of ten, then I'm, I'm in the Hall of Fame. But that's the case also with selling and building relationships and almost anything that's worthwhile. Uh, Brad was telling me a few days ago, he said, you know, I've probably failed more times than anybody. But he got back up and did it again. He kept getting back up and doing it. And the numbers are these. And these are average numbers that you see up here. Uh, if you talk to 1,000 people in the sales arena, uh, you get to see about 100 of them that might have an interest in what you're doing. 
and then you might go ahead. Yeah, and what he's talking about, guys, too, it's not used car salesman knowledge that he's sharing with you. He's sharing with you, think about how many albums are recorded a year, okay? And think how many songs are actually on that album. Now think about that as a funnel of how, how the chances are of you getting a song on a record. It's slim to none, but if you do it thousands and thousands and thousands of times and you keep at it, you eventually start playing the odds and you win. So, you know, it goes hand in hand with a lot of things. So here's, and, and I'd, I'd usually like to get to know the audience just a little bit. So how many of you in here are, are salespeople? How many of you are involved in sales? Okay, how many are not involved in sales? Okay, now here's the question. How many of you have friends? Hands. Some of you don't have friends. I see that. Uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. Okay. Kids? Okay. You got friends. You've got a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You got kids. You're selling. You may have heard that before. But the process to develop relationships and to persuade people is the same for everyone. And the science behind it is this. And there's actually lots of research on this. When people make decisions in their lives, they go through a predictable, repeatable process. So when you decided to buy the hat, the scarf, the car, uh, the chains, the shoes, you went through a process that's about four or five steps in that process. And I know you're going to go through it. If you decide you're going to go into a certain major, you're going to become an engineer, you thought through, there's, there's some thing, you went through the same process in order to come up with, this is what I'm going to do with my life. So anytime you make a decision, there's a predictable, repeatable process that you're going to go through. So if I want to persuade you, if I want to influence you in some way, then if I understand the process that you're going through, I'm going to have a better chance of persuading you. And here's, here's, the, here's the, the key to that in persuading people. On that first slide back there, we, talked, we talk about we're not out trying to sell partnerships or we're not out trying to st sell sponsorships. What we're trying to do is, is find people who need what we have. If you want to persuade someone, you find someone who needs what you have. It's not talking someone into wanting what you have, but it's really revealing what they want. So it's more about them. It's not about you talking about what you want to do. It's more about understanding who they are and what they're about. It's about developing the relationships with those we want to persuade. And everything that Brad and Kane have talked about up here of the networking and getting to know people, that is a skill that you can actually learn. How are we doing? Good. Okay. We got a couple minutes. All right. So as a salesperson, and I've, I've tried to help people learn over the last 20 years, selling, sell, is not a four-letter word. It's something that we do every day, something we, we are engaged in every day. We call it something else sometimes, persuasion or influence or whatever you want to call it. But it's more about understanding the other person, understanding what they want and what they need, and then trying to help them get what they want and what they need. And in turn, I will get that. Yeah, and what he, what he's telling you, what he's telling the guys I, again, I, you have to really understand that because what do you think when you when you present a song to an artist? What are you going to sit up there and talk about yourself? Well, you go ahead and do that, and you're not going to get your song cut. You ask about them. What do you like? What are you feeling? What are you into? And then you might have one song you're going to pitch them or conversate with him you might have one song that you change your mind because it might be a love song and he might be breaking up with his girlfriend you play that for him you're gonna piss him off real quick you know so guys we got to wrap it up I, I wanted to spend a little bit more time with this I'm gonna pull up a slide here though um, take down this information and you guys can email us any questions you have and we are running this program on campus uh, it starts up in June again. You can talk with your career advisors, advisors and, and whatnot or the direction you go to, to get that kind of information. And we look forward to possibly seeing some of you guys in June. Thank you all for Thank your you. time. Thank you. Thank you.